I'm Colleen Campbell, Professor of Emergency Medicine at UCSD, and today we're going to talk about aortic catastrophes and what you need to know about the aorta. This is the abbreviated version, so please see our website at UCSD Emergency Ultrasound for the full lecture. I have no disclosures other than I have to say I have never seen an aorta this transparent. So the reason why we use ultrasound for the aorta and diagnosing suspected abdominal aortic aneurysm is because it is an excellent modality, it's fast, and it's something you can learn quite quickly. The sensitivity is 99% with a likelihood ratio of 10.8 to infinity. The specificity is 98% with a likelihood ratio of zero to 0 0.25. So you can't get much better of a test than this. So it's a great day to save lives and we can do that with our trusty bedside ultrasound. First, we're gonna use a curvilinear or a phased array probe and we will set our depth to 20 centimeters. We will exert firm pressure just below the xiphoid and aim the probe directly perpendicular to the skin towards the back. We will start out transverse with the marker dot to the patient's right side and we will identify the spine shadow as the deepest structure and set our depth one centimeter deep to the spine shadow. On the left, we will see the aorta. On the right, we will see the inferior vena cava. Now on the left-hand side, the aorta will appear thick-walled. It will be on the left side of the abdomen directly above the vertebral body. There will be no respiratory collapse. In contrast, the inferior vena cava will be thin-walled and compressible with the probe. It will be just to the right of the spine and we will see respiratory variation as evidenced by the positive sniff test. For our technique for the abdominal aorta, we know that 90% of those will be infrarenal. So we will definitely scan from just below the xiphoid down to the iliac bifurcation, somewhere around the umbilicus. When we measure, as opposed to what we see in this picture, we will measure outer wall to outer wall. So we want to get the biggest diameter of the aorta that we see. Oftentimes when we do this mid-abdomen, we can't see everything because there will be bowel gas in the way. So we will always have a backup plan, which we'll talk about more in a minute. When we look at physical exam sensitivity and think about not using the ultrasound, we decide we should use the ultrasound all of the time because even when we have an aneurysm greater than five centimeters, we would miss at least 25% of those on physical exam. Ultrasound, in contrast, has a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 96 to 99%. We know that if we see an aneurysm greater than 5.5 centimeters, this will need to be repaired. And we also know that if it grows more than 0.6 to 0.8 centimeters per year, it will need repair. The branches of the aorta that we will look for are the celiac as the first branch. We will see on the left side the splenic artery and on the right side the common hepatic artery. Very rarely we may catch a glimpse of the left gastric artery as it moves superiorly. And what we see here is spine shadow. Directly above it we will find the aorta. And above the aorta, we see the SMA, the superior mesenteric artery, surrounded by thick white mesentery. Now, as we scan superior, we get a glance of the celiac axis here, which looks like a seagull. And that shows the common hepatic artery and the splenic artery. Now, right next to the aorta, we see the inferior vena cava, 
And just above that, we will see the portal confluence right here. So these are the structures we will see on the proximal aorta. Now, the, just for you, and this makes me super excited, even seeing it right now, is a look at the elusive left gastric artery right here. We see the common hepatic and the splenic artery, and then we get a hint of the left gastric just as it's going superior. So that's super special, and I want you all to look for this on your own in patients. Let's go over the anatomy now of the superior mesenteric artery. We know it originates at L1, and it supplies the small intestine, the ascending, and the transverse colon. We know that the SMA is in the region of the pancreas. It runs just posterior to the pancreas. So if we see the SMA, we know that just anterior to that, we will see the head and body of the pancreas and we may even be able to see the tail of the pancreas on the left side. It gives branches of the pancreaticoduodenal arteries. The renal arteries branch just below the SMA, and sometimes we can see this in long axis view of the aorta. The SMA is the most readily identified branch of the aorta because it's surrounded by thick white mesentery neural and lymphatic structures. And it can be found about three centimeters above the umbilicus. Here we see a great video of this. We see spine shadow, we see aorta, and just above this surrounded by thick white mesentery is the SMA right there. Above that, we see the pancreas here and a piece of portal confluence coming up and over to meet splenic vein. Now in between the aorta and the inferior vena cava, we see the left renal vein coursing in between the aorta and the SMA. So that's a nice picture of that. And actually here off the aorta, you see a little branch of the right renal artery coming off as well. In long axis, we get a great view of the celiac trunk and the SMA. Oftentimes, we'll see renal arteries posterior. If we put color flow on that, we can better identify all of the structures. For the distal aorta, we're looking for a gradual widening of the aorta just above the spine shadow. And you notice here in this picture, I have decreased my depth because the aorta will travel anterior in the body as you go down towards the bifurcation of the iliac arteries. So oftentimes as you're sliding your probe down, you will be decreasing your depth at the same time. And here we went all the way to the bifurcation. Now, we always need a backup view in the aorta, and I mentioned it earlier. And the reason why is because there's a lot of bowel gas when you try to put the probe over the transverse colon, and sometimes you can't always get it all out of the way. So if you go in the mid-axillary line on the right side with your marker dot towards the patient's head, then you can get your backup view of the aorta. I actually like to call it the Campbell backup plan because I love it so much. I set my depth to 15 to 20 centimeters. And as I fan slightly posterior, I will bring in the diaphragm and the aorta. And this is what it looks like. Here is aorta, here is diaphragm, this is liver, and here we can see inferior vena cava and hepatic veins. So we can get a backup view of the aorta when we otherwise wouldn't be able to see it. And we see the thicker walls in the aorta as opposed to the respiratory variation in the inferior vena cava. So again, this is head to toe. My marker dot is on the right side of the body and the ultrasound waves are traveling from right to left. 
Now, if we happen to see an aneurysm, the first thing you wanna do is put some color flow on there. This is after you scream for the vascular surgeon because you really wanna know, is there active extravasation or not? And here in this case, you can see on the right-hand side that there clearly is. So that makes the scream even louder for the vascular surgeon who hopefully gets there in time to do this, which is place an endovascular stent and repair the aorta before that person dies. That's key. Risk factors for AAA. I had to bring up President Trump because he is a poster child for a AAA. He's old, greater than 65. He's white, he's male, former smoker, and probably has atherosclerotic heart disease, although I have not looked at his heart personally. For aneurysms, talking about risk factors, we know that an aneurysm is more than three centimeters and that 90% are fusiform. We know that 10% are saccular. And we know that almost all of them occur around or below the renal arteries. So as you get even older to 85 years old, there's 300 per 100,000 people. It's the top 15 causes of death in patients over 85 years old, and the prevalence is four to 8%. Aortic aneurysm still accounts for 15,000 annual deaths in the United States per year. Dissections are also very uh, mortality causing and um, they are even more difficult to diagnose. Sometimes on x-ray we might see apical capping or tracheal deviation to the right or a loss of a paratracheal stripe but oftentimes we don't see anything specific on a chest x-ray. So we always try to look with the ultrasound when we suspect and sometimes we may just see a flap in the aorta and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use that color flow again and we're going to see if there's any signs of turbulence in the aorta or a false lumen now because dissections are difficult to diagnose sometimes they just look like a clot in the aorta this one was actually in the femoral artery but it just looked like a clot this patient came in as a transfer from another hospital on a heparin drip for a presumed arterial clot in his leg. The only problem is I noticed that he had a diminished pulse on his right arm as well. And when I looked up in his neck, he looked like he had a clot in his right common carotid artery when I put my marker dot towards his head. So we know that if we have diminished pulses in an arm and a leg, we know that this is very sinister for a dissection. And he did finally admit that chest pain will come up at 4.30, at which point we needed to turn off the heparin drip. Now we know that most dissections occur around the root. So usually we're gonna start with a parasternal long axis view of the heart like this one. And this one may be opposite in the way you've normally seen it, but we see the left atrium the left ventricle with the mitral valve here, and then the aortic valve here in a dilated aortic root, because we know the root should be about the same size as the left atrium. We also see pericardial fluid or blood, which makes us even more worried about this person's outcome. And then we see a flap, which does not involve the aortic valve, and that makes us really think we are dealing with a very deadly dissection. Aortic dissection is the great masquerader. I've seen it present in a number of ways. By definition, it's a tear in the wall of the aorta between the intima and the media, and it has a 1% mortality per hour. It actually accounts for three per 100,000 cases of acute back or chest pain. And actually, if you suspect it, you should definitely do further imaging because even in confirmed cases, 
people only suspected it 15 to 40 percent of the time. So that's very scary. Risk factors are a little bit different than aneurysm. Hypertension does account for a risk factor or an acute increase in blood pressure, such as methamphetamine or ecstasy use or weightlifting even. In young patients, greater than 50% of patients under the age of 40 with uh, aortic dissection have a connective tissue disorder. Pregnancy, vasculitis, syphilis are also risk factors, as is pre-existing aneurysm. Of those patients with dissection, only 50% will present with a pulse deficit, and less than 50% will present with a diastolic murmur. 20% present with Horner syndrome, 30% die in the ER, and 30% die in the OR, and a great number of people die before they ever get to the hospital. So this is an extremely deadly disease. This is a case we saw who came in with chest pain, and I knew that most of them start at the aortic root. So I actually looked at a sternal notch view as seen up top here. I put the probe in the sternal notch, and I was looking at the aorta and its branches. And this is the right pulmonary artery. And what I saw was this turbulence and lack of flow here and part of the descending aorta and immediately called vascular surgery based on this scan, and this patient was brought to the OR. This was a DBAKI-3, or descending aortic root aneurysm. Most of them are ascending aortic root aneurysms. In summary, when you're dealing with a problem in the aorta, Definitely use firm pressure on the probe, rock your probe left and right to get the bowel gas out of the way and continue that firm pressure on the aorta to prevent bowel gas from getting back in your way. Your probe will be held perpendicular to the skin and you will scan from below the xiphoid to the umbilicus at the iliac bifurcation. You will use color flow to check for extravasation you will use the Campbell or backup view in the right mid axillary region with your marker dot up towards the head to get a second look at the aorta. And if you do find a problem, the goal is to load the boat as soon as possible. Get your consultants on board before you do any further confirmatory tests. Do you have any questions? So the biggest thing about the aorta is keep scanning it. You will find pathology and you will feel comfortable with this soon after you start doing these scans. Best of luck.